I just need to see if the captions are working. One second. Welcome to an adventure. I hope that you can see and hear me. Uh, this is Our Goal Adventures, and I am uh, Rogan27, also Anthony Wright Day Hernandez, Community Collections Archivist at Virginia Tech. And um, this show is streaming on both the library's channel, twitch.tv slash VTUL Studios, as well as my personal channel, twitch.tv slash Rogan27. So, <clears throat> Sterling, what are you doing here? I thought you had class. But also, it's good to see you. And um, everybody, please bombard Sterling with um, birthday eve wishes or birthday wishes. I shouldn't say. Sterling's birthday is this week. Bombard Sterling with birthday wishes, please. <laughs> um, I'm, I'm so good at being chill. Um, Lord Portico, hello. It's good to see you. Uh, let's see. Key Squared, thank you so much for the 37-month resubscription. Welcome. It's good to see you. You're in a Zoom class and gonna lurk. Aw. I appreciate that you are here. Um, hi, Hannah. Be in and out covering the service desk. Ugh. I have that tomorrow. Uh, <laughs> Matt M33 on a three stream street. Welcome. It is good to see you as well. Indeed. Indeed. Face. Um, okay. Yes. Happy pre-birthday. Hooray at Sterling for your completion of another orbital lap. Mm -hmm. I dearly miss uh, having Sterling here every day. I'm going to keep saying this because it is true. Um, <clears throat> but also, show. <laughs> All right, so this is Archival Adventures. Uh, this is a once a week program where we look at materials from special collections and university archives at Virginia Tech. Um, <laughs> most of the time I've not 
seen the items or haven't seen them in depth. I'm not super familiar with them usually. Um, for the past year and a half, most of the time I hadn't seen them at all because um, Sterling was doing the, the pre-stream uh, prep for me. Um, this episode, however, is the first one where I was back to doing it myself, <laughs> which is fine. Um, but for this episode, we are hearkening back to one of our prior episodes. I don't remember which one, honestly. It was um, an episode where we looked at Comet, uh, a pulp sci-fi magazine. I don't even remember because I... I couldn't dig. I didn't have time. So I don't remember even if it was last year or the year before. But it was when we looked at Comet that we came across uh, a, a letter. This isn't the full letter. If, if, if we want the full letter, I can... In issue one... <clears throat> There's a spot for reader mail called Rocket Mail. And um, in it is a letter addressed to the editor of Comet, uh, F. Orland Tremaine, from Sam Moskowitz. I did not know at the time who Sam Moskowitz was. I have since looked up Sam Moskowitz, and we'll look at that in a second and know who he is. And um, But in this letter, he has this section uh, where he's talking specifically about during Tremaine's time as editor of Astounding Stories that he printed a bunch of stories that Moskowitz uh, deemed to be, you can you can sort of see it under, let me hang on, um, that he deemed could be called classics of science fiction. This letter was dated 1940, and he's pointing to items from 34, 35, 36, and 37, and calling them classics. So I thought, Hey, it's a list of stories. We should look at them. And that's what we're going to start doing today. <laughs> you were sorting Comet in the video library today? Just the other kind of Comet. NASA tapes. Um, okay. Before we dive in, since we are here at uh, since we are he <laughs> here at Virginia Tech, which is a big educational institution, um, we just like to you know remember and acknowledge the history of land grant universities uh, in the United States of America and. Virginia Tech's uh, role <laughs> historically, um, Virginia Tech acknowledges that we live and work on the Tutelo and Monacan people's homeland, and we recognize that th their continued relationships with their lands and waterways. We further acknowledge that the Morrill Land Grant College Act of 1862 enabled the Commonwealth of Virginia to finance and found Virginia Tech through the forced removal of native nations from their lands in California and other areas in the West. Virginia Tech acknowledges that its Blacksburg campus sits partly on land that was previously the site of the Smithfield and Solitude Plantations, owned by members of the Preston family. Between the 1770s and the 1860s, the, 60s, the Prestons and other local white families that owned parcels of what became Virginia Tech also owned hundreds of enslaved people. Enslaved Black people generated resources that financed Virginia Tech's predecessor institution, the Preston and Olin Institute and they also worked on the construction of its building. 
So that, that statement was prepared by the Office for Inclusion and Diversity here at Virginia Tech. There is a longer version. If you want to find that, um, you can visit that website there. Okay, so we are going to be looking at Um, we're going to be looking at this list, but first we need to pay attention to who the people are and then, uh, we will today be looking specifically at the first title here. Oh, hang on. It was doing fine highlighting things. On the other one, never mind. Uh, the first title: "Farewell to Earth." <laughs> I know how all of my technology works. All right, so "Farewell to Earth." Um, well, so we have the letter, and uh, I'll just summarize here. During 34 to 37, as editor of Astounding, F. Orland Tremaine printed scores of stories that were out-and-out -out classics of science fiction. I'll never forget them as long as I live. It isn't necessary for me to refer to my old issues to remember their titles. Only a scant few of them are Farewell to Earth, Colossus, Rebirth, Shortwave Experiment, Mana from Mars, Succubus, Rex, Twilight, Man of the Ages, The Mole Pirate, Old Faithful, The Lotus Eaters, Knight, The Mad Moon, Davy Jones Ambassador, The Red Perry, The Adaptive Ultimate, Alas, All Thinking, He from Pro Procyon, The Far Way, Stars, and The Plain People. Now, of the list here, I'm an, I'm, I read lots of science fiction. It has been my primary genre most of my life. Of the list here, I'm familiar with the Lotus Eaters. And I'm familiar with He from Procyon. The other ones? Not certain. <laughs> so I'm interested to see uh, what these stories are um, and see if we can tell why Sam Moskowitz considered them to be classics, even though they were less than a decade old. Um, but first, who the heck is Sam Moskowitz? It was just signed Sam Moskowitz, but I didn't know who he was. Well, as you can see here from the Wikipedia article about him, <laughs> um, He's an American writer, critic, and historian of science fiction. So if you needed an authoritative voice to tell you what the classic science fiction works of the early 1930s was, or were, um, he seems like a decent authority to take that from. I, I, I take it uh, from the reaction in some of my previous streams, um, the reaction in chat when I mentioned Sam Moskowitz, it seems that some of you did know who Moskowitz was, uh, but there's a picture of him. He was born in, born in 1920, died in 97. Um, he was, while still in his teens, he became chairman of the first World Science Fiction Convention. Worldcon? He barred several members of the rival Futurians Club from the convention because they threatened to disrupt it. Referred to by historians of fandom as the Great Exclusion Act? <laughs> oh my. I actually might know about the, uh, the Futurians were a group of science fiction fans, many of whom became editors and writers as well. 
Based in New York City, a major force in the development of science fiction writing and science fiction fandom in the years 37 to 45, I feel like I might have heard of the Great Exclusion Act, um, referring specifically to the Futurians being banned from Worldcon, but I don't remember when. Key squared! Congratulations, you've randomly been selected as VIP for the stream. Enjoy your digital diamond. Anyway, uh, let's see. Moskowitz uh, founded the Eastern Science Fiction Association, based in Newark, New Jersey. He edited Science Fiction Plus, um, compiled some two dozen anthologies, few single author collections. His most enduring work is likely to be his writing on the history of science fiction, in particular two collections of short author biographies, Explorers of the Infinite and Seekers of Tomorrow, as well as the highly regarded Under the Moons of Mars, a history and anthology of the scientific romance in the Muncie magazines, 1912 to 1920. His exhaustive cataloging of early science fiction magazine stories by important genre authors remains the best resource for non-specialists. Okay, so he's got some bona fides when it comes to science fiction. So his opinion is one that maybe we should look at. Um, now, all of the stories that were mentioned in his letter to the editor were edited by F. Orland Tremaine and published in, Ast in Astounding Stories. He limited his list to that domain. Stories edited by Tremaine and published in Astounding Stories. So this is um, the Internet Science Fiction Database, uh, and this is the grid of all um, Astounding Stories issues. So you can see here, uh, the first issue was published sometime in January of 1930, and the final issue in September of 37. <clears throat> and F. Orland Tremaine was editor from 30, October 33 to October 37. It's interesting, oh, because it changes story, it changes titles. So you see here it continues and it's got a date in 1960. It's because it changes titles uh, from Astounding Stories to um, Analog? I'm not certain. Uh, analog Science Fact and Fiction. Uh, after, like, it, it changed to Astounding Science Fiction and then to Analog Science Fact and Fiction. Um, and then, later, just Analog. Um, <clears throat> so, oh, it's yelling at me for not being logged in. It's okay. Whatever. Um, all right. Quickly, the Encyclopedia of Science Fiction. This is actually one of my favorite resources. I love visiting the Encyclopedia of Science Fiction. Um, Sam Moskowitz, his entry here. Uh, we already saw most of this from Wikipedia. Um, he worked under the pen name Sam Martin uh, as an editor for trade magazines for the frozen food industry, retiring in 1985. Uh, for a long time, prominent member of science fiction fandom, best known of all historians and commentators within genre science fiction. I'm just curious what their definition is. So, genre SF. By this term used widely in this encyclopedia, we mean science fiction that is either labeled science fiction or is instantly recognized by its readership as belonging to that category, or usually both. The implication is that any author of genre science fiction is conscious of working within a genre with 
certain habits of thought, certain conventions, some might say rules, of storytelling. These conventions are embedded primarily in a set of texts, which are generally agreed to contain them. This might seem to be a circular definition, as though when we're saying that genre science fiction is a set of conventions located in genre science fiction stories, but it is in fact a spiral. A text published in 1930 may describe something, say, a form of matter transmission, so well that in 1935 the description has become recognized as a model or convention, and in 1940 a second text may be published which shows its agreement with the convention by repeating it with variations which themselves enrich it. Partly this spiral is created by science fiction readers and partly it governs... Okay, yeah, okay. Uh, finally, from an abiding sense shared by most readers of the science fiction community, the genre of science fiction is an intrinsic part of U.S. history and literature. Yay! Um, genre science fiction tale will be a story written after 1926 published, or theoretically publish a bull in a United States science fiction magazine, or specialist science fiction press, and conspicuous for its signals that it is honoring the compact between writers and readers to respect the protocols embedded in the texts which make up the canon. <laughs> uh, to work variations on these protocols is clever, and indeed required, but to abandon them is to leave home. For many years, leaving home in this fashion, as for instance, Kurt Vonnegut Jr. was was deemed to have done, was considered a form of treason. For some writers and readers, this attitude remains. Similarly, works of fiction which use science fiction themes in seeming ignorance or contempt of the protocols, often works from so-called mainstream writers of science fiction, frequently go unread by those immersed in genre science fiction, and if they are read, tend to be treated as invasive and alien and incompetent. This snobbery, which, wow, this is, uh, th this encyclopedia tends to be full of bias. It, it is certainly not an unbiased source in any way. There is a certain perspective uh, that appears in these. Anyway, I did not know that this definition was going to be so long. Um, anyway, after 1926, instantly recognizable as science fiction, obeying some rules that I don't see delineated anywhere here. <laughs> When we use the term genre science fiction in this encyclopedia, we are not making a shortcut definition, clearly not, of the genre of science fiction. We are referring to those science fiction works which honor the contract. Which contract? I didn't read any contract. Let me see the contract. I have a lawyer in the chat. <laughs> anyway. Um, so we, we generally know Moskowitz now. Moskowitz is someone who could be considered an authority on the genre. <laughs> a lawyer, not your lawyer. Oh, nothing, Lord Portico, just um, uh, the definition of genre of science fiction uh, kept referring to a contract that people needed to follow, um, but never actually detailed what that contract was, and it's a theoretical contract anyway, so... Um, <laughs> How did the first issue of a magazine or comic already have a letters page? Oh, um, so we go into that on the episode that I did about Comet, but basically um, editor F. Orland Tremaine was launching his new magazine. Um, and so he was launching Comet and... Um, because he was a well-known name in the industry. He had letters from people who knew he was working on launching his own magazine. Because Yeah, I agree. It's weird that there's already a letters from the readers section in the first issue of a magazine. But... Um, <clears throat> He opens the section by saying, 
uh, hope uh, taking. I'm not going to rate the stories. So the section is for readers to send in things. I received letters from many of our favorite authors. I might almost say all of them promising to write for the comet. Some of them say very nice things, but I felt it would be sort of anticlimactic to publish them. Let's make this space expand and keep it alive. We can, but don't forget to tell your friends about the comment. Um, and then he's in an aside, I no, sir, no sooner completed the above letter than one from Sam Moskowitz came to my desk with a fan's summation of the field today and saying things which obviously I could not say. It is a pleasure to know that some of us remember remember you can well believe i don't know i that's i feel like there's words missing from that sentence but anyway <clears throat> so he was writing an introduction to what would be the section for readers to send in things um and as he was doing the introduction to that section he got a letter from sam moskowitz uh, that he felt I guess would fit. I don't know. But yeah, he published it there. Uh, there, There is, um, in fact, the Sam Moskowitz Archive Award, which I discovered just today while pulling up the webpage to see who he was. Uh, it is named for Sam Moskowitz, presented for excellence in science fiction collecting. There's an award for being good at collecting science fiction. How did I not know that there was an award for excellence in science fiction collecting? It, the last winners listed here are 2022. Uh, and it seems like often it goes unawarded the first it was first given in 98 I just thought that was cool like he's got an award named after him from a, a someplace called first fandom that that gives out the award um <clears throat> all right uh so Tremaine uh there is an article about F Orland Tremaine in the science fiction and encyclopedia of science fiction. We delved into this a lot on that previous episode. Um if anybody can figure out what episode it was uh let me know. Actually, I'm going to I'm going to check really quickly to see if a quick search could find it. I think it should find it fairly easily. It was not this year. <laughs> it was uh, May 17th, 2023, um, when we looked at Comet. And and so we dug into who was F. Orland Tremaine um, and, and things like that. Um, I'm assuming I can't just submit a photo of the pile on my dining room table. I don't know. I have not... I know nothing other than that it exists now, which is more than I knew before. Uh, but yeah, so Tremaine was a prolific editor of some of these uh, magazines, um, worked on a bunch of them, founded a couple of them, including Comet. Um, so the first item that Moskowitz listed in his list was a story titled Farewell to Earth. And knowing that it would have been edited by Tremaine and published in Astounding, and that the title was Farewell to Earth, um, using the Internet Science Fiction Database, uh, it was pretty easy to find. Farewell to Earth, short fiction by Donald Wandre, um, Astounding Stories, December 33, edited by F. Orland Tremaine. 
So that's the one we're going to look at first. Incidentally, it's part of a series. It's number two in a series. Anyway, um, December 1933. Astounding Stories, a Street and Smith publication. Let me switch views here. If I can get my cursor where I need it to be. All right, December 1933. It cost 20 cents to get the magazine. Um, do, 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 do. I'm trying to get you a, a view of the entire cover at once because I, I thought you might want to see that. Okay. Um, it does say NRA member. I'm assuming that that actually is the same NRA. I don't know. I haven't looked. Um, I'm going to look now, though. Make sure I'm not overlighting things for you real quick. We're going to look at the story here in a second, because that's the main thing I want to know about. Uh, okay. Incorporated 1871. Uh, I want to see what their logos have looked like. Ah, it, I, I, I have found an answer and it is, um, not where my brain went. So I'm glad I looked. So NRA today in the U.S., immediately you think of the National Rifle Association. And I was like, okay. But in fact, NRA member in this case refers to the National Recovery Administration. Um, <clears throat> so this would have been, this was 1933. So the recovery in question would be, I would assume the stock market crash of December of 1929. Uh, Prime agency developed by U.S. President Franklin Delano Roosevelt. Eliminate cutthroat competition by bringing industry, labor, and government together to create codes of fair practices and set prices. The NRA was created by the National Industrial Recovery Act and allowed industries to get together and write codes of fair competition. The codes intended both to help workers set minimum wages and maximum weekly hours, as well as minimum prices at which products could be sold. Okay. Popular with workers. Businesses that supported put the symbol in their shop windows and on their packages. <clears throat> Though they did not always go along with the regulations entailed. In 1935, the U.S. Supreme Court unanimously declared that the NRA law was unconstitutional, un unconstitutional, ruling that it infringed the separation of powers under the United States Constitution. It quickly stopped operations, but many of its labor provisions reappeared in the National, National Labor Relations Act passed later the same year. The long-term result was a surge in growth and power of unions, which became a core of the New Deal coalition. Interesting. Okay, I was unfamiliar with the National Recovery Administration. <clears throat> to be frank, in the 50s 
and 60s, the NRA was more a gun safety organization than what they are now. Still, this NRA makes more sense in context. Yes. Um, okay, that's that's pretty cool. And really interesting, like, their logo is has, like, it's all about the blue eagle. This eagle is not blue. This eagle is purple. I guess they didn't have the Pantone code or the, the Pantone color name or the, like, anyway, sorry. Uh, <clears throat> this first issue, I'm not even going to bother trying. Um, the Both covers are not attached. And so I'm, if I try to make it appear that they are, it's just going to damage them more. Um, <clears throat> all right. On sale, third Wednesday of each month. Astounding Stories. Okay. Table of Contents. Uh, we have a couple of authors in here. Nat Shack, Shatchner, A.T. Locke, Hal K. Wells, J. Gibson Tyler Jr., Jack Williamson, Clark Ashton Smith, Paul Starr, Donald Wandre, uh, Charles Willard Diffin. Okay, and the one that we are interested in is the novelette Farewell to Earth by Donald Wandry. So, as I always do, who the heck is this author? Because I don't know this author. Uh, but I, I preload some web pages so that we can find out. Born in 1908, uh, lived until 1987. U.S. editor and author, founder of August, founder with August Derleth in 1939 of Arkham House, uh, which they formed initially to publish the work of H.P. Lovecraft, whom both admired deeply. Well, That brings a caution to what we're doing today. Uh, Wandre res resigned his interest in the firm after World War II when he also stopped writing new fiction, though much has been published for the first time in recent years. And uh, after Derleth's death in 1971, he declined to resume it. As a writer, he was justifiably best known for his fantasy and weird stories, beginning with The Red Brain, October 1927, Weird Tales, a tale that incorporates a bungled science fiction premise about the nature of matter into a narrative whose deepest effect is one of chill horror at the cosmos or vastation? All right. Later science fiction work, much of it in Astounding in the 1930s, is similarly compounded of disparate ingredients, and the tales assembled in the posthumous Colossus, the collected science fiction of Donald Wandry, uh, and Don't Dream, the collected horror, okay, uh, share the sense of the grotesqueness of the world espoused in that first story. Oddly, Fantasy Magazine solicited him to contribute to the science fiction round robin tale, The Challenge from Beyond, for its September 35 issue, Okay. Apparently he did write some stuff within the Cthulhu Mythos, which makes sense if he was a co-founder of Arkham House. <clears throat> yeah. Apparently was born in St. Paul, Minnesota. But yeah, um, the fact that he deeply admired H.P. Lovecraft is a bit concerning. Uh, I suppose we'll find out. Um, we're looking for page 98. Farewell to Earth, and it, it starts with an illustration. Uh, 
Uh, there is no artist listed anywhere in the book. I was unable to find. I did look. Um, I couldn't find any credit for who the artist was. It might be possible if you compare and search. It's possible that it would be po that one could make a supposition as to who the artist was based on other works, but I don't have time to do that sort of analysis right now. Um, the caption reads, The massive wall of the glacier showed that the Ice Age was returning. Um, an eldritch tentacle rises up, waving a red flag. Uh-huh. Hi, Iron Trout. How are you? Um, so, to have this be the first story listed in the letter uh, kind of threw me for a loop a little bit because I found the story and immediately it said, being a sequel to the story in the October issue. Which immediately tells me, well, I need to look at the October issue. Right? Okay, come on. Stop bouncing. Well, I have the October issue. <laughs> we'll come back to this issue in a second here. But, um, oh, and we have more um, Charles Atlas. <laughs> We, we looked at those ads, the Charles Atlas ads, and uh, talked about their association with the Rocky Horror Picture Show, um, <clears throat> uh, I don't know, a couple months ago. October 1933, Astounding Stories. You can see this has been somewhat used. Uh, somebody doodled, <laughs> cross-hatched the letter A. Um, it, it's been cut a little bit, and so the NRA membership is cut off a bit. Sci-fi magazines should go back to having ads for buff shirtless men in them. I agree, but my opinion generally doesn't count. <clears throat> All right, so it's the sequel to the Donald Wandre story from this issue, which is titled A Race Through Time and begins on page 18. Pages are pretty dry, which makes them slightly brittle. I love that they're illustrated. <clears throat> he was too late. The damage was done. Um, I'm not going to read A Race Through Time. I'm going to find a synopsis of it because the point of the stream today was to um, specifically look at the other story, but I wanted to locate this one. And let me see what I can find in, insofar as a synopsis. Unless somebody already knows this story. <laughs> to show you all what I'm doing. That's fine. <laughs> I found this site, the Internet Time Travel Database. <laughs> we often visit the Internet Science Fiction Database. Apparently there is an Internet Time Travel Database as well. <clears throat> Released in October of 1933, A Race Through Time, novelette, 
science fiction aimed at an adult audience. Content, time phenomena, original language, English. Oh, I'm... Uh, okay. Evil Daniel kidnaps Ellen and takes her to the year 1 million AD via metabolic speed up. Not to worry. Good and compassionate Webster follows via relativistic time dilation. That's a really quick synopsis, right? <laughs> There's a quote in here. What I've done is to build a space-time traveler working, working by atomic energy. Even as long ago as 1913, you know, Rutherford succeeded in partly breaking down the hydrogen atom. By 1933, others succeeded in partially breaking down atoms with high voltages of electricity. But they used up far more energy than they got back or released. I've simply perfected the method to a point where, with an initial bombardment of 50 volts, I can break down one atom and get back thousands of times the energy I put in. There's nothing strange or wonderful or miraculous about it. I don't create energy or a power from nothing. I simply liberate energy that already exists. Part of the power I use to break down another atom and so on, while the rest is diverted to propel the torpedo by discharging through tubes like a rocket. I've made one short experimental trip. Interesting. Okay. Uh, I am about to look at spoilers because we want the spoilers so that we can look at the sequel. <clears throat> Time periods. Circa AD 1950 to 1959, Webb notes that he is in the year AD 1,001,950, exactly one million years after his starting point. Far future in the year AD 1 million, quote, they emerged finally upon the site where New York had risen in its vastness and halted in dismay. A smooth plain rolled for them, plain on which no building or habitation remained. Time travel methods. Uh, time ships, a long torpedo-like object of silvery and symmetric beauty. Themes, altered metabolic rates. Similar to Webb, Daniel also has one-way travel to the future. I don't know who this Webb is that they're a Webster. Okay. Uh, <clears throat> Daniels also has one-way travel to the future, but his travel is based on a drug that greatly slows his metabolic rate. Relativistic time dilation, the crux of Webb's time travel, seems to be in special relativity. He'll travel fast and return centuries later without much aging himself. But he seems to think this also involves going faster than light, though only as an extension of relativity and not in the usual returned on the previous night manner. Uh, mad scientists, Daniels, the evil genius, ruled by personal ambition and the desire for power. Okay, okay. Well, it sounds like it might be a, an interesting story. Um, unfortunately, I do not have time to look at more than one uh, today. And the one we're interested in is not this one. <laughs> <laughs> but I thought it would be good, because apparently it's part of a series, to know what happened in the first one. So, this Daniel person kidnapped Ellen and took her a million years into the future via metabolic speed-up. And then uh, Webster followed via relativistic time dilation. Um, and... We know that while there, they discovered that um, where New York previously sat was just a fair plain with no evidence of ever being inhabited by humans. So that's what we know from the story that came before this one. All right, so let's see what this story is all about. <clears throat> We're starting in the year 1,001,950. Webb Conning strode eastward toward the sea. Behind him lay the Ellen. Oh, the, uh, wait. Ellen was... 
Oh, no. <laughs> Ellen was... He, he named his ship after the girl he went to save. I was very confused for a second. Behind him lay the Ellen the space-time cruiser in which he had traveled a million years ahead of his period. Behind him lay the Crystal Dome, where Warren Daniels and Ellen Mahorm had drunk of for, for, had drunk of corporal and adrenaline drug. Ooh. Sorry. I can read the words that are in front of me. To light the smoke slightly better for my purposes. Um. <laughs> so I am curious as to why uh, why Moskowitz was considering this to be a classic. Uh, that's one thing that I'm going to try and think about while I'm reading. Stop. <laughs> okay. Uh, behind him lay the Crystal Dome, where Warren Daniels and Ellen McCorm had drunk of corporal and adrenaline, drugs of retarded animation that made them sleep through almost a million years. I want to know how they protected their bodies while they slept for a million years. Um, and behind him also lay his shattered hopes, for Warren had abducted Ellen and set their date of emergence for the year one million, whereas Webb had miscalculated and followed them 1950 years too late. There was no way of going back. Long ago, they had died and turned to dust. The girl he loved had waited in vain in this dismaying world so different from the earth he had known. Well, that's a depressing start. The evil Warren Daniels kidnaps Ellen McCorm and they travel forward in time one million years by, slowing their, by, by speeding up their metabolism. <clears throat> and Webster web conning in an attempt to save her used relativistic time dilation to travel forward in time except that Daniels and McCorm traveled forward to the year one million And Webb Conning, in trying to save them, traveled forward one million years. Putting him in the year one million, 1,950. <clears throat> That's depressing. Overhead hung a gigantic sun a dull, dying crimson sphere that covered at least one-twelfth of the heavens and yet shed only feeble rays, light that was cold and darkly red. Elsewhere, the sky seemed black and desolate. A piercing chill struck through the thin air. Shapes of strange vegetation freaked the plain through which he walked. Enormous fungi, gray and ghostly, flung their caps and tendrils to the sun, Powdery dust stirred hardly at all in the scant atmosphere. Neither insect nor animal uh, disturbed the solitude. This was a world of death. Webb had passed beyond self-recrimination, beyond hatred of Warren, almost beyond love and dreams. So deep was his bitterness at the results of his own error. But he walked on for even despair could not wholly shatter his curiosity to know what this world of the far future was like. In one hand, he held a piece of shale. Upon it were scrawled directions written by Ellen nearly 2,000 years before. Idle directions, for he had, uh, idle directions, for he had never come, 
and her days or years of vain waiting have long since become one with all eternity. <clears throat> he tried to forget, to suppress his thoughts, to interest himself in this alien world, but always a vision warped his gaze, a vision of the girl and the love that had meant as much to him as life itself. They were gone now, and life seemed hardly worth the living in this strange barren land. Or was it as barren as it looked? Might there not be people somewhere ahead? Surely the changes of a million years were vast, and the desolation around him did not necessarily mean that mankind had become extinct. What would these inhabitants of the far future be like? Or rather of the present, he thought wryly. He whistled a tune of the middle 20th century. The notes quivered hollowly, eerily. Uh, <clears throat> the notes quivered hollowly, eerily forth, a discordant and unnatural intrusion upon the brooding silence. After a few bars, he ceased. Silence was preferable to that forlorn echo of a dead eon. Come on. I turn the pages, and it decides it just wants to jump. My camera is hyperactive today. <clears throat> All right. After a few bars, he ceased. Silence was preferable to the forlorn echo of a dead eon. Huge and waning, the sun shone dismal. Some catastrophe must have brought it far closer to the earth. Shortened its life and drained it of energy. Its rays bathed the world in bloody color. Like the reflection of a gigantic fire. Or the glow of cosmic flames. But the air preserved its chill and only sparse growths raised spikes and stalks of great alien fungus forms to the somber sky as he made his way eastward, a lone traveler in eternity. He could not be far from the site of New York City, and if the old metropolis had perished, at least the Atlantic seaboard would be as probable a place as any to find the inhabitants of this queer world. Again, a pang seized him. What if his brilliant invention brought him only the irony of being the last representative of the human race? What inhabitants could there be? What had happened to Ellen and Warren? Had they died? Leaving no record or issue behind them? Had they married, raised children, and lived their delayed natural span? If so, what would their descendants have become? during the course of almost 2,000 years? Would they have intermarried with whatever other inhabitants there were? Or was this world as devoid of life as it looked? In that case, would not, inter would not inbreeding have wrought profound degenerative changes in the race founded by Warren and Ellen? Webb racked his brain with idle speculations. They gave him no comfort. After a million years, his love persisted for that unusual girl as ever of old, and the cruel jest that fate had played him yielded only recurrent pain. Never had he felt so lonely as now, never so desirous of the drowsy poppies of oblivion. To sleep, and for all time, appeared to be the end of desire and dreams. Only the sleep eternal in an eternal night. The phrase from a famous poem ran through his head, together with another. The moving finger writes, and having writ, moves off. I do not know either of these poems. <clears throat> he steeled himself to face whatever lay ahead. Regrets were as unavailing as the vanished years, though he had lost love and the most precious values of life. Though he was separated by 10,000 centuries from the period when he should have lived his span, though he had thus far found only a world deserted in the year 1,000,000,1950, though he should prove to be the last representative of the human race, yet the indomitable will to continue drove him on. The same grim determination that had carried man forward since the dawn days 
when he first found sh uh, shelter and fire. Shelter, fire, food. The inexorable demands of nature could be ignored no longer. But of shelter, there was none. A rolling plain sloped eastward. He followed what was once a broad highway, but it lay covered with rust, rotted, broken by occasional fungoid growths. He passed several giant mounds, buildings of curious hypergeometric architecture, but now fallen to ruin. Miles ahead, he discerned a great blob on the landscape. If that was New York, it had indeed crept miles out into the Atlantic. The coast must have risen. In all this vastness of land and sky, absolutely no other form of animate life was visible. Not a sound came, and only a cold ripple of the rarefied atmosphere infrequently proved that nature had not completely run down. The fields around, black and ochre and brown, spread scarlet bathed in the sun. Grass, weeds, flowers, underbrush, trees, all were gone. Only the fantastic mushrooms, dwarf and giant, great cones and whitish stalks and bulbous caps appeared here and there. Webb almost shouted with relief when he came upon a gray-green spiky plant, a cactus. It was his first evidence that fungi did not form the whole botanic world. Fire raised a less imperative problem. Unless night brought exceptional cold, in his pockets were a magnifying glass and an automatic lighter, either of which should suffice to produce fire if he could find anything to burn or cook. Food gave him his greatest concern. He was ravenous and thirsty. He thought wryly that anyone who hadn't eaten for a million years certainly deserved a good meal. The absence of game and fowl disturbed him, while the bleak landscape indicated that not in ages had anyone traveled this way. The mystery of what great calamity had fallen the human race, war, invasion from other planets, holocaust from some unknown natural cause, cosmic disaster, became of negative importance. He must find food and water quickly. <laughs> he decided to keep on toward the site of New York. Uh, the fungi might be edible, but uh, perhaps better nourishment could be found at the metropolis, even if the city were deserted. The slow progress of the sun suggested that the day had considerably lengthened. Webb had no means of measuring time, but hours must have passed before he reached the outskirts of the city, yet the sun seemed not much farther westward than when he left his space-time flyer. Uh, distance was deceptive. I'm trying to get it so that I don't have to, like, turn pages quite as much and shift things around quite as much. One second. So far, it seems like an interesting story. There we go. Distance was deceptive in this thin atmosphere. He wished he had used his cruiser. He halted, appalled on the edge of New York. The city presented a spectacle of colossal ruin that was overwhelming. Uh, debris littered the streets, piled them in places dozens of feet deep with rubble. Small stone structures yawned emptily. Pylons and narrow towers soaring thousands of feet toward the sky gaped with broken windows and black fissures. Whole sides of edifices had been stripped away, and corrosion ate at the framework. It was as if a race of titans had abandoned to eternity the megalithic remains of their dwelling place. Here and there, towering, serrated, 
obelisk-like erections had crashed into tremendous shards. Uh, and not one voice called, or one footstep passed, or one bird sang in all this heap of huge ruin. Uh, even the frosty air, the wane air, even the frosty air, the waning bloody sun, and the bleak landscape were testaments of desertion. Webb had not the heart to explore. The dull sun, the abandoned city, the sinister hue of everything, the primeval vegetation drugged his senses. He turned wearily aside, took out a pocket knife, and began hacking experimentally at the nearest growths. A clump of ten-foot-high mushrooms resembling a uh, Lepiotis of the 20th century. Their texture was woody, but they looked edible. He did not much care whether they were. He had come to a reckless mood where he almost wished that a fatal poison were in them. Raw mushrooms did not appeal to him, despite his famished condition. He entered the closest building, a small structure of marble and shattered arabesque glass windows. Inside, he found dust, inch deep, the rooms of some ancient family residence. Skeletons whose very bones already disintegrated. Golden yellow utensils that had outlasted human clay. Heaps of powder, uh, which alone remained of unknown foods. And most precious of all, a private artesian well. The fixtures were coated, eaten away, but they still produced water of metallic taste. He drank greedily before carrying away utensils laden with cold, clear water. He set the pans in a little hollow before continuing his search for fuel. But of wood there was none, neither tree, bush, nor grass, and he was forced to hunt far afield, even into the dead city's limits, before he found enough dried fungi and punk wood from decayed furniture to build a fire. <clears throat> he dumped his loot in the hollow, departed again, and slashed at the lesser giant mushrooms until he had several huge stalks. These he carried back toward the hollow until he rounded the building from which he had obtained his pans and water. Then he halted in momentary paralysis, and his burden slipped to the ground. A woman, like a ghostly flame in the crimson of the sun, was standing beside the hollow. Both creature and woman, she resembled the women of his age, yet with a difference. She was, if anything, of slighter build, but her limbs were longer than of old, and her whole chest larger as if from the greater expansion required in a thinner atmosphere. A singular whiteness gave pale beauty to her skin. Her eyes were phenomenally large and luminous, and her face both wistful and stern. Platinum-colored hair hung in thick masses down her back. She wore a garment of rough texture, falling from shoulders to thighs, and of such plain simplicity that it emphasized her exotic appearance. With slight sandals on her feet, she resembled in some ways the naiads of old Greek myth, Diana the Huntress. There were strength and weakness in her figure, the soft patrician outlines of inbreeding in her features, combined with the supple strength of those who must pit themselves against nature. She seemed lithe as a panther, able as a warrior, yet weaker than a yet weaker than a woman, and she held an allure of extraordinary power. More than all these physical characteristics, the quality that impressed Webb most was her general resemblance to the Ellen of his memory. Instinctively, in the first shock of seeing her and the glad surprise of finding companionship, he ran toward her with a sudden cry, Ellen! The girl looked at him with wonder that changed to a baffling expression of many emotions. Her hand flashed down, swept up with a tiny dart, and a blowgun aimed squarely at him. The dart looked wicked. Webb stopped, threw his hands wide. I'm unarmed! 
Don't let loose, for heaven's sake. Who are you? An expression of uncertainty transformed the girl's face. There was the dawn of something akin to radiance. She opened her mouth, but whatever she intended to say remained unuttered. Webb's keen eyes saw be beyond the girl. <clears throat> From behind her, along the ancient highway, approaching with sinister rapidity, came menace in multiple forms. Could these be great? Could these be gray puffballs drifting silently along the ground? Behind you! Watch out! Webb shouted and at the same time raced toward her. The girl hesitated, whirled around, converging upon her like a succession of giant bowling balls. Hurled at high speed, a stream of grayish masses rolled. They had no visible legs. Gelatinous, almost spherical, they advanced by a contracting muscular tension that gave them extraordinary impetus. Silent like everything else in this dying world, ruddy in the light of the sun, and purposeful in a way that was subhuman, subvertebrate, and primal, yet with an apparently conscious intent, they sped toward the girl. Big as bushel baskets, slimy as oysters, gray as the pallor of death, the fluid, quivering balls shot forward. The nearest one was hardly a dozen yards away when she whirled. No more than a dozen feet separated them when she blew through the tube. A dart buried itself in the gray mass. It twisted crazily to a limp, formless, sloppy heap at her feet. Again and again she aimed. The things skittered to rest around her in the collapse of death, but others came faster than she could mow them down. Webb raced to her side, weaponless. He had no idea how he could help, but did not even know the nature of this, or he did not even know the nature of this menace. A slug sped toward his feet. He jumped and landed squarely on the creature. It squished into a pulpy mess that oozed momentarily almost to his knees before flattening out. <clears throat> he pulled himself free of the sticky stuff, and still the gray ones charged. With sudden inspiration, he ran to the nearest dead monster and pulled out the dart. He plunged it instantly into a living creature. More slowly than the first victim, it whirled and tossed and spun to convulsive death. The gray ones came on, silent, driving like cannonballs. Never a cry issued from the girl or a sound from the jelly-like attackers. All the world around was still. The battle seemed like a nightmare, with the vast sun casting a liver-colored glow on fantastic vegetation and strange monsters. Step by step, Webb and the girl retreated. A sickening change uh, took place. Gave them unexpected aid. Some of the hurtling monsters turned aside to their fallen companions. Around each dead mass clustered a group of the living, and they visibly swelled while the motionless heaps were devoured. The poison on the darts must have possessed terrific potency. The bloated gray spheres wo wobbled off and succumbed, or died where they were, fat and ravenous, even while they fed. Their numbers dwindled. Webb and the girl, retreating more slowly, slew the beasts faster. The horde ceased to attack. Of that ferocious army, only stragglers remained. The two human beings mowed them down without mercy, singly and in groups where they consumed the fallen. Only when the last sphere flattened did the fury of battle subside. Trembling, exhausted and bewildered, Webb sat on a rock beside which the wearier girl had already dropped. 
there was a silent communion that neither disturbed until uh, until panting lungs and tired bodies had rested. Cautiously, yet half indifferently, Webb looked at the dozens of blobs around, and from them he turned his gaze back to the mysterious, lovely stranger. Who are you? he blurted. Where did you come from? What are these things? The girl looked at him with wide green eyes. At close range, her face <clears throat> was weirdly attractive with its delicate skin, soft lines, and determination. She owed beauty of an uh, she owned beauty of an unusual kind. The sun brought tints of pale flame to her and gave a smoldering glow to her features. She looked at Webb from wise, interested eyes, though she seemed not twenty. I am Ellen. Ellen what? No, Elliot. The girl regarded him with a puzzled expression. Her voice was very low and slurry, and though she had not spoken to anyone in a long, uh, as though she had not spoken to anyone in a long while, and she had a queer pronunciation that made it difficult for Webb to follow her. Roughly, her words were English, but about as unlike the English he knew as it was from the language of Chaucer. <clears throat> Don't talk now, he said abruptly. Fatigue lay heavy on Ellen, Ellen's face. She half smiled like a child as he continued, sit over here. I'm going to cook these mushrooms. We can talk after we've eaten. He could not tell whether she understood him. She leaned back against a giant uh, bolitas and watched him while he built a fire. Her presence affected him oddly. She so much resembled, resembled Ellen, uh, the Ellen he had known, and yet her exotic characteristics, the large chest, small waist, long limbs, and delicate features with sharp, bright eyes, these were all at variance with the average woman as he had known her long ago. Midway in his preparations, she suddenly rose with critical eyes. Go away, she commanded. That's no good. Both piqued and amused, Webb found himself dispossessed. She took charge deftly. He watched her expert fingers build the fire and cook the mushrooms about twice as rapidly and well as he could have done. She hummed an eerie song as she worked, and the wordless tune plaintively, or and, and the wordless tune plaintive, lyrical in her soft voice, captivated him. When the scant meal was prepared, she handed the Lepiotis to him with a shy gesture. He evidently puzzled her as much as she did him, but a disconcerting attitude of proprietorship had crept into her manner. Her large eyes examined him with a sort of pleased curiosity. Without a word, she curled beside him. They ate in silence. Webb ravenously, the girl rather indifferently. Webb was bursting with questions, but curiosity never yet proved stronger than thirst and hunger. He had not quite finished when he looked up and found Elian's green, luminous eyes fastened upon him. Her lips parted and he barely noticed her small, sharp teeth before she electrified him with a simple statement. I am glad you came, Webb Conning. <clears throat> In a vague fashion, he had half expected something of the sort, yet the words were a bombshell in his... Uh, in, in this world a million years beyond his time. Perhaps he had heard wrongly. It was hard to understand her slurred alien syllables. 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 Uh, she possessed a powerful attraction. Perhaps this was all a weird dream. Still, the appearance of wistful, human, childlike faith on the faith... <sighs> Sorry. I'm... <laughs> Silly bulls, yes. <laughs> My tongue is starting to trip just a, just a little bit here. Um, <clears throat> one second. She possessed a powerful attraction. Perhaps this was all a weird dream. Still, the appearance of wistful, human, childlike faith on the face of this strange young woman was as real as the memory of Ellen. 
How did you know? Who are you? He asked, a sudden tightness in his throat. The girl listened intently. She found it likewise difficult to understand. He repeated his questions slowly, each word distinct. Her face lightened. My mother told me. <clears throat> Who was your mother? Elian. Webb figuratively tore his hair. The girl was exasperating. Her answers were so simple as to be obscure. The conversation got nowhere. But the very naivete, uh, naivete of it was a refreshingly human touch. Listen, Angel. Okay. That was a very condescending way to start a sentence. Listen, Angel. Angel? What is that? She frowned with delightful seriousness. Never mind. I'll tell you in a better, uh, I'll tell you in a better way soon enough. But I'd like to know, why did your mother mention my name? Her mother told her. Thank you for dropping the historical terms command. Um, and who was her mother? Elian. Webb started to swear, then smiled. The simple sureness of this elf disconcerted and disarmed him at the same time. He laughed and suggested, I suppose her mother was also Elian. Yes, the girl gazed at his face. Gradually, her own serious expression changed, lightened. She smiled, uttered a musical laugh, then looked surprised. I've never done that. What is it? Wait, what? I got a little confused. He laughed. Okay. And suggested, I suppose her mother was also Elliot. Yes, the girl gazed at his face. Gradually, her own serious expression changed. Lightened. She smiled, uttered a musical laugh, then looked surprised. I've never done that. What is it? Never mind, Elian. I'll tell you sometime. Webb smiled. The girl responded, responded, and the ice was broken. She had never laughed before? That's sad. Um, <clears throat> what do you know about me? How did you know who I was? Webb insisted. Slowly, in her peculiar English, she recited a story that she had evidently learned by heart when an infant. I am the daughter of Elian, who was the daughter of Elian. Until far back, there was the first Elian. She and Warren were the first two. All the Elians and the Warrens came from them. Warren? Like you. Webb took a deep breath. So strong were the emotions that gripped him. Elian and Warren. Ellen and Warren. Names modified only slightly in the course of time. So Elian was a def descendant of the Ellen he had loved. Go on, he urged eagerly. <clears throat> Elian continued, with grave, intent eyes like a child remembering a lesson. I was told by my mother to look for Webb Conning. He would come out of nothing, like the first Warren and Elian. He would look like you. Webb smiled, but did not interrupt. When you came, the Elian who found you was to tell you that she is yours. The first Elian was yours, but you did not come. I found you, so you are mine. In that profound moment, a host of memories flooded Webb's mind. Ellen had never lost faith in him. All through the years of exile, uh, she had waited. And though she waited in vain, she had built up in her children a legend so strong that when she came, her child of whatever generation would know him and carry to him her spirit. Greater faith had no woman, for Ellen was a love that out Ellen's was a love that outlasted the centuries and defeated even the grave. Motivated by complex impulses, Webb gently bent over and kissed the fragile lips of the girl. She looked startled, bewildered. 
till a change came with a rush of warm radiance, and she leaned beside him, her face aglow. Webb sighed sleepily, sleep. Webb sighed deeply, hungrily. Go on, he commanded. Where, where are the other Ellens and Warrens? How many are there? There aren't any. I'm the last one. He stiffened. What? There were only a few. There is not much food. They died early. And the Meebs caught many. Meebs? Who are they? Those. We killed them when I found you. She pointed to the gray heaps, sprawled not far away. Meebs? Meebs? A light dawned on Webb. Meebs. Amoebas. The spheres were giant amoebas. Somehow, somewhere in the past, life had become extinct so that only the lowest and simplest organisms had survived or had opportunity to, re to re-begin the long course of evolution. The one-celled amoeba had escaped catastrophe, and during the course of thousands of years, it had evolved to the size he saw. A sea dweller now developing the power of land locomotion, just as the slime of primeval seas had given birth to land vertebrates, and so in the progress of millions of years had produced the genus Pomo. A formidable monster already, little more than a huge stomach motivated solely by the, by the basic need of food. He became... <laughs> I love that the captions are rendering this as the killing of memes. <laughs> I, I, I could comment on the uh, beautiful alien woman encountered who offers herself immediately to the man. Um, it is a... Indeed, classic sci-fi trope and it is very much present here uh, he became conscious of Elian's soft voice the Meebs live along the sea they stay in it by night and come out after the sun rises they are very hungry they killed many of us they caught my people the darts kill them but they slew my people when they were not on watch and you are the last one yes I have not seen an Elian or a Warren for... She shrugged her shoulders. How long? The sun has risen and set more than, more than this many hundred days since I last saw one. She spread her fingers wide. Webb gasped. A thousand days, three years, perhaps nine or ten years of time as he knew it? Taking into consideration the longer day, nine or ten years without a human voice, without companionship, without conversation. No wonder Elian had trouble remembering words. His heart went out in sympathy for this apparently frail creature who had somehow found the strength to survive through desolate years of loneliness more complete than that of Crusoe, who at least knew that other people were alive. How did you happen to be here when I came? Do you live by the city? Or do you, do you live in the city? I stay here. She turned her green eyes upon him with frank confidence. It was amazing how readily and easily she accepted him. I knew you would come. The first Elian would not let her daughter marry until after her seventh birthday. I think our years are longer than they used to be. There's a story I heard that long ago, they were only a third as long as they are now because the day was shorter. Every Elian since was free until seven. She was yours if you came. The first Warren fought, but Elian won. <laughs> the habit was made a rule. Many people have always lived here. The first Elian said you would come down this road when you came. So we have lived here. I found you, so you are mine. The girl looked both wistful and starved, but with a radiant happiness now overtoning her face. Webb again lost himself in reverie. His odyssey of time and space had not been wholly wasted. His flight through the universe, his annihilation of centuries, brought him 
at least close to the woman he sought. And though he had arrived 2,000 years too late, the gods were kind. He imagined too keenly the years of Ellen's waiting, with hope growing ever dimmer, her hard struggle for existence in a hostile world, uh, and mated to a man she did not love. Her laborious effort to establish the legend of Webb's coming, and her great task of educating from memory alone her children, in order that the fruit of civilization might not perish. He visualized the development of the new race, its attempts to adjust itself to a radically changed world, the modifications of eyes, skin, limbs, lungs, and physique that were necessary for adaptation to this dying planet. But what was done was done. Nothing could recover the dead from, from oblivion. Webb forced his thoughts from morbid retrospect. Are you rested enough? He abruptly asked the girl. Come, show me the city and where you stay. <clears throat> what do you all think so far? I think... I can see why Moskowitz thought that this was a classic. It definitely um, has a number of features in it that I think are iconic within the genre. Um, some of them are problematic, like man encounters uh, an alien female creature who <clears throat> immediately tells him that she is for him. It does seem very thoughtful in its own way, but so, so troubling. I, I can see how stories like this eventually led to the original series of Star Trek. I can see direct a direct path from this to uh, to Captain Kirk. <clears throat> I don't know how much more there is. It's a it's listed as a novella. Oh, somebody is interesting. Somebody has uh, marked a page in here. And it wasn't me. Actually thinking about the people's feelings, which in and of itself isn't wasn't terribly common in the early days of science fiction. It's just kind of terrible at it. Yeah. Um, I also... I am... Pleasantly surprised... Uh, insofar as uh, there hasn't been a lot that, because uh, in in learning about the author, it noted that he was a fan, he was a great admirer of H.P. Lovecraft, and um, H.P. Lovecraft was an extremely racist man uh, <clears throat> who was involved in um, the white supremacist movements in the United States and. So that, that gave me some pause at the beginning. And I mean, I can see his description of Elian with the platinum hair and the super, super pale skin. And I can see a little bit of, of that, but it's not overt. Like it's, it doesn't seem to like infuse um, in quite the uh, aggressive way that I was kind of scared it might. Um, <laughs> I did also his, the immediate jump to the conclusion of um, after hearing them called Meebs 
and realizing that they were amoebas, there's this discourse on how a new course of evolution had happened that's super detailed and there's no way he could have known that he could know that much <laughs> but it's fine it it he's good at painting a picture with words um i i, I think his the way he writes flows really well and is is descriptive uh there's a lot of detail I can see why this would have been thought of as classic. <clears throat> uh, upward. Ever upward, on top of buried streets, around massive blocks of marble and shattered sculpture, across mounds of debris, over the wreckage of ancient New York, Webb and Elian made their way. She told what she knew of the missing million years, how it was that in that in olden times a great city had thrived and other cities elsewhere till the coming of a comet that sucked away the atmosphere and caused the earth to shake animals birds and fish legendary creatures to her had perished with the human race somehow the first elian and warren had slept on and when they wakened they alone survived they made their home in New York. They explored a little, but virtually all their life was occupied with raising children to perpetuate the race. Having not much more than mushrooms for food, in an atmosphere far thinner than the air to which they were accustomed, a longer day and night of Arctic cold to contend with, possessing few medical supplies, they were faced at every turn with defeat they might well have been Adam and Eve relying on their own resources in a latter-day wilderness. They might easily have chosen death except for the inexplicable, indomitable will of humanity to survive at any cost and against all odds. <clears throat> Through the labyrinth of tremendous ruin, Elian led Webb toward the city's heart. and upward by ways winding toward one colossal structure that soared to the very heavens, a tower rising more than a mile above the tallest buildings around it, a vast finger erect and challenging like Titan's work, symbolizing defiance of time and space. They entered it at some unknown floor, so deep was the wreckage and debris in the street, this is my home, said Elian. There were caskets of roughly fitted golden yellow plates in the room they entered. Floor after floor they ascended, and caskets occupied each, a meager array representing the last survivors of humanity, Ellen's and Warren's children. Near the last level, Elian pulled Webb away from the warped staircase into a chamber where the light of the sun filtered somberly upon twin coffins resting side by side. The first Elian and Warren, she informed him simply. Webb felt as if he had plunged into icy waters, and the poignant irony of the situation struck him like a, like a blow. Here lay the bones of the girl he had loved, pursued through time and space, and lost. Beside her, the man who had cheated her, tricked her, won her, abducted her into a future age. In a single gesture of devotion, Webb swooped over, or stooped over the coffin lid beneath which Ellen slept her last sleep. By that symbol, uniting himself with her through her child of the hundredth generation. Stooped over the coffin lid. Yeah. Okay. Elian looked on, interpreting vaguely, and made no response when Webb spoke gruffly. Let's go on. They climbed wearily to the topmost pinnacle. Through a decaying skylight, they emerged upon an observation platform that was already weathering away. Webb caught his breath 
at sight of the wild panorama on every side. To the north, leagues and hundreds of leagues off, stretched the glittering frozen wall of a glacier. As far as he could see from west to east, that stupendous wall of reddened ice swept toward distant horizons where it vanished over the rims of the world. The Ice Age, the age of glaciers, must be coming again. Above that titanic glacier, which capped the entire northern world, the sky gaped, slaty black and cloudless. Eastward curved the Atlantic, as smooth as glass, only along its shore did specks move, amoebas seeking prey. Southward and westward lay worn hills and starved earth, a land of barren age, scarred with the ruinous cities of a civilization that had perished. The scene was appalling in its immensity and bleakness. The fading sun, now sinking westward, stared like the bloodshot eye of a giant upon this wreckage of a planet. The air, never warm even at midday, grew chiller with the waning of afternoon. Webb shivered, as much from awe at the great brooding desolation as from cold. Elian regarded him with solemn eyes. Grave child of eternity that she was, she knew what an oppressive weight the panorama must be casting on his thoughts. Silently, Webb turned away. And they began the descent, many floors down. Elian drew him aside from the staircase, uh, drew him aside from the staircase well to a passage westward. Tottering, insecure, the flying arch curved to a smaller tower a half mile off. This bit feels Lovecraftian in, in the less creepy way. The awe and horror at the void. Yeah. Uh, I, the cosmic horror, but recognizing the vastness uh, and and how small humanity is in comparison, um, I agree. <clears throat> Where does this lead to? Webb asked. Things. I do not know what, she replied simply. I often go there and look at them. Sometimes I take one I like. Midway across the arch, where a section of floor had fallen, Webb looked down through thousands of feet of space. There was less debris in the streets here. He thought he could detect traffic levels, bizarre architectural designs such as had been projected by artisans of his time, setbacks and hanging gardens, but the dream city was only a crumbling skeleton. From the arch, they came out into a spacious room, at this height, the structure occupied a full city block. Its base must have occupied acres of ground. Many other rooms adjoined this one, and all were laden with treasures. Elian had taken him to a museum. She led him first to a corner, where she proudly showed him the things she had picked out for herself. Bracelets, rings, necklaces, Mayan ornaments, Chinese jade, lockets from Persia the delicate and often eccentric jewelry of latter civilizations. She had chosen well of pearls and blazing gems and patterned gold to emphasize her beauty. He at length turned away from these trinkets to other objects. This was the floor of music, evidently, and amid a few familiar instruments, some of which had corroded or rotted almost to dust in the display cases, lay countless others of strange shape, whose tone he could merely guess at. Winds and iridescent uh, metalloys, electrical and supersonic devices of intricate pattern, keyboards that played color, and keys that transformed light into sound and sound into symphonies of many colored light. The highly developed and to him almost meaningless musical arts of a culture that must have considered this the highest aesthetic expression of man's aspirations. Room by room he examined them, floor by floor he descended. The graphic arts were represented by sculpture of godlike beauty and profound symbolism, presenting cycles of myth and fable and vision far beyond his understanding. Once impressive, 
and magnificently conceived canvases, which disintegrated in their frames. Miracles of gorgeous color, and at times terrifying suggestion in their exhaustion of the possibilities of the physical and imaginative realms, but teaks of decadent splendor. They were architectural, there were architectural models of asymmetric and ultra geometric lines. The halls of the dance held complete pictorial recordings of dances and dancers whose art had developed supernal meanings during thousands of centuries. As they descended, all that was finest and highest in man's goals passed before their eyes in retrogression. Below the floors of the eleven arts they came to the exhibits of crafts, metalworking and pottery, textiles and fabrics, weaves through all of them, or weaves, weaves, through them all, as through the basic arts, running a lushness of color, a beauty of form, and a richness of design that were infinitely and sometimes disturbingly alien to the life he had known. Two new colors tortured his eyes, pictures of a fantastically leisurely life, scenes of wars and events, inventions and fancies, uh, pleasures beyond dreams, dreams themselves of cosmic majesty, all the characteristics of an age of luxury, plenty, and carefree living drew his attention and told him something of the fate of man in that lost million years. Then the sciences, planetariums, biological and racial exhibits, experiments in plastic, prenatal molding. Webb felt a queasy sensation in studying skeletons and preserved figures when he saw that man had found the secret of changing his own physical nature. The race that perished had been a race of small, exquisite people, winged and single-sexed, each individual combining the features of the two sexes of his day. The very thought of the immense gulf separating his period from the climax of a million years made him dizzy, opening vistas of a wholly new culture, rising from an artificially created race of different sensations, aesthetics, purposes, pleasures, and existence from those he knew. The chemistry and metallurgy uh, exhibitions escaped his comprehension. There were more than a dozen new elements above 92. In the Hall of Medicine and Surgery, he found the record of triumph over disease. Bacteria had been eliminated. Sickness had become a thing of the ancient past. All the afflictions of humanity had been conquered. There was evidence that these ethereal beings lived for hundreds of years. Thus, always downward, overwhelmed with the vestiges of a golden age, they made their way through all the halls of science to the floors of mechanics and invention. Here were the machines that replaced the labor of man, complex, elaborate, gleaming equipment of stainless alloys, machines that tapped the energy of the sun, the moon, uh, and tides of the earth's core and matter itself. Individual machines that took care of all work once performed by hand, master machines controlled from a distance, perhaps by rays or waves unknown to Webb's generation, and which themselves controlled dozens, hundreds, thousands of lesser machines in a manner almost rational. At the bottom of this titanic monument of man's achievements lay a library, symbolizing communication as the root of all knowledge. A library whose scope rivaled imagination. Ancient volumes, microscopic trifles that showed up as weighty treatises or elusive poems under the lens of a magnifying glass. Books of metal leaf, thin as a window pane, yet containing thousands of pages. Books of cryptic symbols and nature to be solved only with the aid of obscure apparatus that transformed the symbols to light and the light to sound. 
I need to read that one again. Books of cryptic symbols in nature to be solved only with the aid of obscure apparatus that transformed the symbols to light and the light to sound. Apart from the cryptic symbols bit, that sounds like he's describing a CD. A CD could fit that description. The aid of obscure apparatus that transformed the symbols, which they're essentially CDs are laser etched with a pattern. It transforms the symbols to light and the light to sound. Anyway, this is of course 1934. CD. But anyway, <clears throat> here were the records of the last world conflict in 21,346, which almost destroyed civilization. The slow rebuilding of life through eons, three invasions of entities from other worlds, strange plagues from outside, earthquakes that sank entire countries, creation of new elements near the year 500,000. The encroachment of a horde of monsters created out of cells and tissue in, la in laboratory research. Rediscovery of the secret of realizing atomic energy in the year 602,981. Uh, a discovery that burst beyond control and started an explosion that progressed with volcanic fury around the world, again annihilating most of mankind. The labors of survivors to rebuild anew creation of the winged, single-sexed race to meet changed conditions during the thousand years, ending in uh, 745,200. <clears throat> the final extermination of microbes responsible for disease. Then, the flowering of mankind until the swift, terrible coming of a dark star near the millionth year which sucked all air off the earth, raised enormous tides, swung the sun close to the earth, and then shot onward, sweeping the moon with it, and leaving the earth a dead planet. Yet these were only tantalizing glimpses. What had the Golden Age really been like? Had decadence set in? Were the little, were the little people subject to empty living because the last goals had been achieved? Why had interplanetary communication been rarely treated? Was human life characteristic of the Earth alone? Had the achievement of goals removed all incentive to ambition, invention, and exploration? In the darkened room where they now stood, far below the level of debris and by the light of antique candles that they had taken from a case on the upper levels, Webb and Elian read the brief account of the tragedy. The newspaper story, which came as a climax to the despairs and hopes and turmoil of a feverish day, telling of the definite approach of the fatal dark star. Webb wanted to read no further, to investigate no more this tomb of a city, to learn nothing additional of the symphony of humanity which had ended in the cord of death. Let's go, he said huskily to Elian. I can't stand this. We'll take my cruiser and head away from here. The sun was halfway sunken when they reached the Ellen. Exhausted, worn from the rigors of battle and exploration of long walking and insufficient air, Webb looked on. Uh, Webb looked on his gleaming cosmocraft with relief. The girl regarded it with weary interest. She evidently had little strength of sustained effort. They entered and Webb threw the controls. A quiver shook the craft as atomic energy drove it up. Elian cried out and clung to Webb. Easy does it, he smiled at her. But if that's the effect it has on you, just wait for the next start. What a jolt I'll give her. Elian relaxed. Under the white light of his cruiser, she looked more real. Her complexion was extremely pale, probably because of the sun's weakened rays, which made protective pigmentation unnecessary, while her eyes, large and luminous, the better to see in feeble light, gave to her 
gave to her face a wistful appeal. Long legs, Webb thought, to cover ground and escape those infernal amoebas. Bigger chest to get enough oxygen out of this thin air. Small waist, no wonder. Anybody's stomach would grow tired of a mushroom diet. But she certainly is Ellen Plus. I'm glad she's not one of those two-sexed things that seem to have become the fashion while I was traveling around. Aloud, he said, Which way, Elian? East or west? <clears throat> that way, she answered immediately, pointing toward the Atlantic. I can walk west. I've never gone this way. Um, he squared, yeah. The, the oof is, is kind of appropriate there, I think. Uh, I'm not even sure where to start. How about just with the scientific inaccuracy of the uh, atmosphere being almost entirely eliminated, uh, the sun reaching red giant stage, and because the sun is a red giant, pale skin makes more sense because the sun's rays are weaker? except that the weakened rays of the sun would have less atmosphere to go through and therefore melanin for protection from the sun would make a lot more sense. And it would be much more likely that she would have darker skin than lighter. But anyway, I'm going to continue. <clears throat> Eternal curiosity of woman and man. Webb, too, wondered what had happened to Europe. Eastward, he set his course, and the Ellen swung around. Oh, cried Elian, snatching away something that momentarily pressed against Webb. What's the matter? She showed him a cluster of darts. He had forgotten them since the battle with the amoebas. What are they? Why do they kill so fast? Elian shrugged. I don't know. There's a big mushroom with a ring around it. It grows out of a cup. My mother told me to boil the mushroom and put stuff from the museum uh, in it when the water is almost gone. Then I put it on the darts. She showed him a bottle of brown fluid. What it was, he could not tell without analysis. Doubtless a powerful poison. The fungus, he guessed, was the deadly amanita, fatal even in small doses. <clears throat> Below them spread the blackened Atlantic. Above, the stars shone with a dazzling, frosty brilliance unrivaled in his memory. A swath of phosphorescent glory marked the Milky Way. In this clear atmosphere, the stars blazed with countless splendor. But nowhere did Webb recognize a constellation, a group, or even a single star. A million years had passed, and the heavens above had become as foreign as the Earth beneath. The Ellen leapt ahead, shot onward at high speed, Less than a half hour elapsed before they neared the British Isles. When, we when Webb turned on the mile-long finger of his telux, a blinding beam cut downward, sweeping the still waters. It moved forward, backward, in all directions, but where England had risen, only the eternal sea lay at rest. He set his course southeast toward France and Europe. The waters were dead. Since the moon was gone, gone were the tides. The sun, because of its retarded motion, had little effect on oceans. Absence of wind and waves prevented aeration. Marine life could not exist. Only the one-celled amoeba, lowest of life forms, had escaped extinction. Silent seas, wind forever still, song of birds, rustle of leaves, flowering of nature, change of seasons, voices of human beings, vanished for all time. Darkness over Europe. Bleak plains and bare hills where no fungus grew, starved earth parching toward final oblivion. Wreckage of cities, giant masterpieces of architecture, towers of impressive and appalling desertion. Desolation brooding over nations and continents. The old age of the earth 
darkness in Europe, twilight of a twilight of a world, death of a planet. Phrases and pictures fitted through Webb's thoughts, weaving a tapestry of somber mood. The Ellen bored southward across the Mediterranean, swung toward Egypt. Deserts stretched endlessly on. Mountains fretted the distance with black peaks. A ravine remained on the Nile. And yet a dark patch of its delta leapt into the glare of Webb's searchlight. He swung the Ellen in a circle. Look, trees, he cried and dipped his cruiser down. Circling in a wide spiral, he dropped toward vegetation that became clearer with increasing speed. He decelerated, brought his cosmocraft to a perfect landing. Elian, who had peered down with the interest of a child during, her, during their trip, bounced out in enthusiasm. Not so fast, cautioned Webb. Where there are forests, there may be animals. He collected an automatic and a ma machete-like blade from his supplies. Bitter cold struck them when they stepped outside. Elian gasped, and Webb's lungs labored in pain as they drew on that rarefied sub-zero air. He pulled her back to the cabin and slammed the door. You'll freeze in that thin dress, he warned. Brr, Thirty below if it's one! Elian rubbed her face, smiled at him ruefully. Webb took a couple of suits out of the storeroom. Technically, the end of stream is here. Do with that what you will. Thank you, Hannah. <clears throat> uh, they were close fitting with atomic heat units, oxygen rectifiers, and visors of flexible gliptol. Vibrators at the mouth and ears enabled Webb and Elian to talk. Teleluxes in the hoods lighted their way. Warm breathing, warm breathing easily again, Webb led Elian toward the forest. What curious trees, he exclaimed. All around them stretched a weird forest. Trees, like vegetation of the Carboniferous Age, rose to a height of some ten feet. Upon a single stalk, many limbs grew. Ears are not usually where one would apply those, he squared. Ding. Um... <clears throat> Upon a single stalk, many limbs grew, hanging limp like tendrils. There was no grass. The trees or bushes stood at irregular intervals. Their trailing branches ended in clusters resembling a cup of moss. The everlasting silence prevailed. Nothing here, said Webb, discouraged and weary. The absence of wildlife was so obvious that he made no attempt to explore farther. I'm tired, Elian murmured. You take the ship. I want to sleep on solid ground for a change. No! Her green eyes blazed. The ground is mine! I'm used to it. You go in the ship. Then we both sleep outdoors. They argued, debated, stormed. Webb's instinctive chivalry and growing love for the girl uh, would not let him see her bare hardship. She refused to listen. Tired as they were, they became mutually stubborn. Elian flung herself on the ground and declined to answer. Webb flatly rejected a berth on his cosmocraft. He was tempted to thrust her bodily inside. She was the last woman alive. Above all else, her safety came first, for the human race must survive. Perhaps it would be best if the two stayed as near each other as possible. Elian already slept. Her face showed as a blur of loveliness through the mask of, gl of Glyptol. Warm in the protective suit, she would doubtless sleep till dawn. Webb's speculations halted at that point. Complete exhaustion overcame him. He dropped to the ground beside her, passed into deep slumber. The sun's rim rose, casting ruby light upon land, sea, and sky. The piercing cold lessened in severity. The air became warmer, a layer of frost everywhere. The sole proof that precipitation still occurred and that the phenomena of nature had not ceased began to dissolve. A shudder passed through trees whose trunks were willowy and whose branches resembled tentacles or snakes. 
the limbs quivered, flexed, moved about oddly. They, sw they swung toward the figures of the two who slept. There came a dreadful change. The curious trees rose higher. Roots, like fingers, appeared. The tentacles waved ominously, restlessly, writhing towards Webb and Elliot. The finger-like roots emerged into full sight, stretched ahead, sank into the soil, while other root fingers followed. The whole forest went into motion, softly, slowly, with a stealthy and hideous purpose. As though animated by intelligence, the trees moved walked. From all sides they converged upon the sleeping pair. A sibilance attended their progress. Murmurs like faraway wind or ghostly voices disturbed by dawn. The trees marched, hungry root fingers and tendrils straining ahead. Were they speaking amongst themselves? Did they whisper of evil plans? What did they intend? Had nature produced these in a last struggle for survival in a changed and antagonistic world? The foremost tree reached Elliot. Its branches swooped down. Tendrils twined around her. Avid suckers fastened at random upon her. They bore her aloft. Elliot opened her eyes. She struggled impotently, shrieked. The shock of wakening to that frightful experience wrenched one scream from her before she fainted. Webb dreamed of a day long ago when he had raced to the Crystal Dome. In his nightmare, he saw again that impregnable hemisphere, Ellen and Warren inside. He dreamed that he beat upon the walls. He dreamed that Ellen raised appealing eyes and cried out for aid. He dreamed that he strove in vain to break the barrier between. Dream horror chained him. Slow, infinitely slow, were his movements. Warren leapt toward Ellen and throttled her cries. Webb hurled himself against the crystal dome. It shattered like a bubble. He wakened. Ellian! He shouted aghast. The terrors of sleep paled before the, this terror of wakefulness. Hungry tendrils were swooping at him. Elliot's limp form swung in the air a dozen yards away. Feelers ripped her protective suit off. Of course. <clears throat> Suckers fastened themselves to her body. These trees not only had the powers of locomotion, some rudimentary form of intelligence. They were carnivorous as well. Webb rolled aside, escaped the straining tendrils by inches. He bounded to his feet, swung the machete in one swift arc. It sheared a tentacle. The tree writhed. A gout of sap, scarlet in the sunlight, bubbled from the incision. An eerie whistle emanated from the plant thing as its branches shook furiously. All the other vegetation advanced like grim avengers. They came fast. Amazingly fast. But Webb sped faster. He must rescue Elliot. Or go down with her. Uh, a group of trees clustered around that one. Uh, a group of trees cross. Blah, 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 blah. <laughs> we're, we're very close to the end of it. So I'll probably try and just finish it. A group of trees clustered around the one that had captured her. They thrust hungry branches out. The finest tree folded its prey clo or <clears throat> The first tree folded its prey closer. Tentacles knocked against limbs. The tree things were fighting amongst themselves for Elliot. Anxiety, fear, desire, horror, complex emotions spurred Webb on. Hundreds of trees were now alive, uh, stalking toward him. If they formed a closed circle, what chances would he and Elian have of escaping? A tree thing wrapped all its branches around the trunk of another, heaved, tore it bodily from the soil, its roots wriggled. The victor fastened suckers of pulp on the roots, devoured them. The captive thrashed madly for only a moment before it relaxed in death. Its captor flung it away. 
as Webb raced toward Elian and took in these fantastic scenes, a plan came to him. He dodged a couple of the things, uh, hacked limbs until his arm grew weary. He saw with terrifying clearness the suckers fastened on Elian's white body and the red wheels that they raised. A tendril entwined his left leg and almost tripped him. He lopped the feeler off, dove headlong for the thing holding Elian aloft. Perhaps it did not notice his attack. It was stalking away from him. Perhaps it needed all its attention to defend itself against the others. Whatever the cause, its roots were half visible and Webb, with one clean stroke, sliced through them all. The thing collapsed with a sibilant whistle. Elian fell free of the cup-shaped spongy suckers. Tentacles from nearby trees darted after her. Webb dropped his machete and caught her. He staggered, thrust his way out of the tentacle of tend... Uh, <laughs> he staggered, thrust his way out of the tangle of tendrils of the dying tree. It was a desperate race that he ran. He fled from trees that came like hunters. He wove his way wherever an opening showed. A machete, or the machete gone, he had only his legs to rely on. And Elian was a burden, though a pleasant one. A group of the plant things ringed the Ellen. He was rapidly becoming winded. The air whispered with voices. A half mile beyond the forest, he saw patches of the blood dark ocean. Its waters rippled, dots emerged and rolled ashore. He became panicky. Amoebas coming out with the suns rising to hunt for food. The distant balls rolled aimlessly around for moments. Then, having somehow got his scent, <clears throat> bowled inland at disheartening speed. Some dodged the trees. Others fell prey to the plant things. <clears throat> Tentacles looped them aloft, folded them inward and upward, beyond reach of rival trees. <clears throat> In this hell of nature, Webb stumbled toward his cosmocraft, wondering if he would ever make it. The ring of trees encompassing it moved nearer. One great stalk stood between him and the door. Half of its root fingers withdrew from earth, stretched on to plant themselves again. The tentacles strained ahead. Webb saw his only chance. With all the momentum he could gather, he lunged straight at the stalk. The crash sent him sprawling, its branches flailing. The tree wobbled and toppled over. Webb rose with Elian and staggered into the ship. Suckers thudded on the door. Great gray spheres plopped against it as he slammed it shut. A minute later, the waters of the Atlantic raced underneath. He set automatic controls before trying to revive Elian. The girl came out of her faint quickly when he forced a stimulant down her throat. She opened haunted eyes and clung to him with fear. You must have had a bad dream, Webb suggested. The trees, they walked. What trees? Nonsense. I thought, I brought you in here last night after you fell asleep. You must have dreamed. <clears throat> Elian sighed. Whether she believed him or not, she seemed content. Sweet as the moment was, Webb interrupted it to get makeshift clothes for her. Where are we going? To New York. After that, away. They reached the city in 15 minutes. Webb set the Ellen on top of the museum. Insisting that Elian guard his flyer, he went down alone and returned with a dozen books, Elian's trinkets, several films, and a number of other things. The books covered basic sciences, including a history of the earth and a survey of arts. The films were technological. We're leaving, he told the girl. Now where? He shrugged. We're going to leave the Earth entirely. Maybe we'll come back someday. Maybe we won't, but we've got to go. We can't live here, and if we did try to, it would be a losing battle. The Earth is dying, and nothing we could do would change fate. Here, eat these before we leave. He handed her a couple of pellets. Oh, gosh. Hello. Welcome. 
Hi, 16-bit Eric. Welcome, uh, welcome, Whimsies. It's good to see you here. I w I'm running over and thought that I probably wasn't going to get raided today, which is fine. I hope that you had fun. I hope that you're, you're, <clears throat> you ran long yourself because you were having a good time. Um, we're having a good time today. Uh, I'm, um, I, sh I, sh I should step back. Hi, welcome to my channel. I'm Rogan27. Um, also, I am Anthony Wright Day Hernandez, a community collections archivist at Virginia Tech. And this is a once weekly show called Archival Adventures, where I share materials from archives and special collections here at Virginia Tech. Um, for 2024, we started uh, featuring something from our, the Heron Speculative Fiction Collection on the last Wednesday of every month. So this being the last Wednesday of the month, uh, we are taking a look at a story in Astounding Stories from December 1933. Um, <clears throat> this being the first in a list of stories that sci-fi historian Sam Moskowitz uh, listed in a letter to the editor that he sent to Comet magazine. It's convoluted. Anyway, we have a list from an authority on science fiction who in 1940 said that this list of stories from astounding stories in the 30s were already classics as of 1940. And I was like, well, let's take a look at them. And so today we've been uh, we've been reading Farewell to Earth by Donald Wandry, um, which is a sequel. Um, <clears throat> Wandry was one of the co-founders of Arkham House, um, and a contemporary of Lovecraft, and um, so far this has been an interesting story um, that I definitely have seen some of the roots that would grow into Captain Kirk <laughs> with um, encountering scantily clad somewhat alien female who immediately says she is his uh yeah it's it's got some problems but also kind of classic and what you expect from that era of science fiction anywho 1933 um welcome in it's great to have you here uh if anybody here was not already following 16-bit eric i encourage you to do so hi blue rooster um I'm going to pick up where I was. We're very close to the end of the story. Um, but if you listen for a bit, maybe you'll get a sense of the tone. Because um, I'm going to try and finish it before I end. Fingers crossed. Okay, so they've just decided, uh, for context for those who just joined, um, Web is... Uh, a guy named Daniels kidnapped a woman named Ellen, uh, gave her, or they both ingested some stuff that sped up their metabolic processes, and they traveled forward to the year one million. Uh, Webb, by using a ship <clears throat> and relativistic time dilation, attempted to follow to save her and went one, mil one million years forward in time, ending up in the year 1 million, 1950. 1,950 years after uh, Daniels and Ellen had awoken from their uh, metabolic sleep. Um, <clears throat> he met one of the descendants of Ellen, uh, the only remaining human derivative person on the planet, um, and they have just decided, or he has just decided, that they're going to leave the Earth entirely. <clears throat> uh, here, eat these before we leave. He handed her a couple of pellets. She looked puzzled. What are they? Food. Concentrated vitamins, proteins, carbohydrates, starches, and minerals. The sentence meant nothing to her, but she ate greedily. And that's that. The Earth is dying. Say goodbye to it, Elian. 
for we're about to go. We'll return later, perhaps, and get whatever else we need, but it won't be for a long time. Right now, it's farewell. Her green eyes smoldered with fires of love and wonder, of today and eternity. You know where we go? Yes, Angel. Once before, I traveled through space and passed a golden star beyond Ursa Major. It's a middle-aged sun, and it has planets. If there is any haven in the universe, it will be there. If we can't live on a satellite of Tau 231, we'll keep on till we do find a place to live. Ready? Uh, it was doubtful if Elian understood much or any of what he said. For answer, she lifted her face to his and deeply, uh, and a deeply felt caress marked journey's end and journey's beginning. Webb slowly pulled himself away. He pointed the Ellen up. Farewell to Earth. He threw the controls and the Cosmocraft winged skyward. <clears throat> That was the end. We, we actually got through the entire story today. It was um, not as bad as I was expecting once we discovered that the author was um, a great admirer of Lovecraft. Uh, <laughs> um, and I definitely can see why Moskowitz named it as um, a sci-fi classic, even though it was only six years old at the time, or six, yeah, roughly six years old when he called it a classic. I, I can see why. It's a really simple story insofar as um, it's only got really two characters in it. Uh, there is some flashback to the... Um, <clears throat> To the previous story, the one that appeared in the October edition, or the, the October issue, um, where Daniels kidnapped Ellen and uh, where all of that took place. Um, but really, this story is just Webb Conning and uh, Elian. And it's really just them exploring what has happened to the Earth what happened to the people, why all the people died. Um, the, <clears throat> uh, the carnivorous moving forest that they encounter in Europe, definitely something that has appeared in multiple places over time. I'm curious as to whether this was the origin of that or whether it uh, showed up in stories before this. Um, I'd, I'd be interested to know because it, it definitely is a thing that shows up after this. Um, in fact, there is a uh, essentially a monster that is exactly that in Dungeons and Dragons today. Um, <clears throat> it was interesting the analysis of the evolution of the human species before it was wiped out by the comet and uh, the progression toward um, uh, uh, after humans were able to genetically modify themselves, they made themselves smaller, gave themselves wings and turned themselves into hermaphrodites, which was an interesting projection for the, the future of, the, of humanity. Uh, especially given that he was a contemporary of Lovecraft and he was writing in the 1930s and that just seems it seems like a projection for humanity that would be written today rather than like 100 years ago I thought it was interesting <clears throat> um, I do need to end though as much as I wish that I could just keep doing this, uh, I do, in fact, have to end my workday and go home at some point. 
Um, so uh, thank you all for joining me. Um, we will not return for another sci-fi story until uh, the 25th of September. But on the 25th of September, we will have another story by the same author, actually. Um, and this one, all I know about it is that the title is Colossus. But we'll have less intro at the beginning because we've done the intro in this episode to talk about why we're looking at these stories, uh, who the relevant players are, and since it's the same author, I don't really need to do a full background on the author either. We can just dive into Colossus and see what we can see about that story, uh, which was the second one that Moskowitz named as a classic um, less than 10 years after it was written. <clears throat> so, um, but next week, in fact, is not speculative fiction. Next week is... Um, oh, we'll be looking at materials about um, <clears throat> victory gardens or war gardens or um, it was, we were supposed to look at this a while back. Oh, thank you for the follow, No Good Nick. Uh, we were supposed to look at the victory gardens stuff weeks ago. And we started looking at things and we got totally sidetracked by propaganda and spent the entire time looking at World War II and World War I propaganda instead of actually getting to the Victory Gardens things. So we'll be looking at Victory Gardens stuff next week. <laughs> um, but uh, for now, I do need to, I do need to uh, bring things to a close so that I can head home because uh, it just hit five o'clock here. Uh, let me just see where we're going to raid today. Um, I'm just looking at, hey, okay. Um, yeah, because I can, and because, um, I like the idea of, of raiding to more educational things. Uh, we're going to raid N. Simplex Pachinko, um, who is, uh, an instructor of mathematics, um, and streams some maths on, on Twitch, um, I encourage you to join me and at least say hi. Um, it is definitely uh, a fun stream to drop in on. You'll learn something, I'm certain. Unless you're also a maths instructor. And then, hey, you might learn something anyway. I don't know. But uh, we'll be heading over there. Let me get the raid started here. Um, and we'll pop on over there for some differential equations, uh, specifically variation of parameters and reduction of order. So, huzzah. Um, please join me in uh, rating over there and saying hello. Thank you all for joining me today. I hope I will see you all again soon for uh, whatever next stream you show up for. Um, and until I do, keep exploring history, everybody. <laughs>